Uh, I'd love to have you open your Bibles to the book of 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians. Uh, I've said James so many times over the last couple of months that it feels kind of strange, but uh, this morning we're starting a new series called A Different Drum, Out of Step Together. And we're going to be looking at uh, the book of 1 Corinthians, but we're also going to use this series as an opportunity to talk about some of the unique values that uh, as a as a staff, uh, as teaching pastors, we feel are, are important for us to just name, to say as a as journey, as a kind of culture that God has called us to, to live out, we, we just want to spend some time naming those values and also naming ways in which the values that, that we want to embody as a church might be different from the values of the culture around us. You ever feel that tension? That like if, if you're following Jesus, if you're a person of faith, that the values that you hold are in some ways just either opposed to or just not the values of people around you. And it creates some tension sometimes in your life. Has anybody ever felt that? Have you felt that recently? Cool. Well, that's what we want to, and if not, uh, we'll, we'll talk about that. You guys awake this morning? Has everybody got a state fair like hangover from like all the pronto pups and Grease and elephant ears and stuff. You guys hit the state fair already? Or are you like, you're waiting to do that this afternoon? Anybody jumping in the arm wrestling competition this afternoon? <laughs> Nobody? All right. Well, it's a, it's a fun thing for our, our community here. So hopefully you get to, get to take part of the state fair here at some point. So let's take a look. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10. Verse 10. I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another in what you say, and there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly united in mind and thought. Uh, If you have been in school recently, or if you can remember uh, writing a thesis statement, anybody familiar with that, right? This is the thesis for this whole letter. Um, that, that this one verse, and this is the verse we're going to be talking about this morning, uh, this is, the, as Paul, uh, the pastor who planted this church in Corinth, he's writing to real people in real situations at a real time in history, facing real issues, and this is his heart, as he's calling the church to be unified in Jesus. And so that's what I want to explore. Um, how many of you know that nature as a whole, that creation, has a tendency to sync up with itself? Um, that, that you as a human being, you were created with this tendency to, to sync up with your surroundings. And it's not just a human phenomenon, it's a natural phenomenon, that nature wants to sync up. How many of you have seen a murmuration of birds? Uh, the same thing is true of like a school of fish. They're, they're beautiful. If you've ever been driving uh, down the countryside and you see this, it's called a murmuration. It's just this massive flock of starlings most of the time. And they, they look like they're dancing. Are you familiar with this? Um, I wanted, I'm not tech savvy enough to, to actually animate this. I wanted to, to get a GIF like on the screen so you could actually see it because it's so mesmerizing. It's so cool. Um, but it's all just random. There, there's nothing rehearsed. It's all just these birds responding to each other and to what's happening around them. And you can see like a bird of prey coming to attack them. And they'll respond. They'll like all move as a whole. And it's like this, this beautiful dance. And it's really, really cool. And the reason this happens is because of this innate sense that they need to sync up with the other birds. They stay close. They take their cues from the birds around them. And so nature uh, syncs up. How many of you uh, are familiar with this song? This is a song called uh, Get Up. I think it's... Git, G-I-T, Git Up. Are you familiar with this song? Turn turn it up, DJ. Come on. Anybody? Anybody going to get up and give us a spectacle? There we go. How many of you know this song? All right, you've you've heard the song. Come on, raise your hands for real. How many of you have the dance moves memorized? I'm serious. This is a place of honesty. How many of you have tried to memorize the dance moves? There's a couple. All right. All right. Those of you who raised your hands, come on up. No, I'm, I'm, I'm joking. I'm joking. So I was on sabbatical this summer, and I, as a part of sabbatical, took a break for three months from social media, and it was wonderful. Highly recommend it. But I came back. 
uh, in mid-July, and I get back on, on Facebook, and my Facebook feed is filled with these people doing this synchronized dance. I'm like, I have no idea what this is, the Get Up Challenge. So I needed to like, do some research so I can stay hip and with it. Um, <laughs> and so I, like, I, I find this, this song, and it has, like I just checked yesterday, it has 27 and a half million views. It's crazy, right? And, and no more than 100 of them are mine. Um, of people of people watching this video and watching these dance moves so that they can be in sync with the dance moves. So when the jam comes on, they know the moves. Is that interesting? That the only thing you need to do, I'm guessing there's a higher percentage in this room that actually have tried or know some of the dance moves, that if we were to just like, no, uh, no inhibitions, play the song, the only thing we'd have to do to get a number of you to be completely in sync with each other is play this one song. Is that crazy? That humans have this tendency, this desire to be in sync with each other. And a song like this, even even the rhythm of the song, it starts to to get your body moving. Uh, Runners know this. If you're you're training for a run, you have a running mix. And the the beats per minute of the songs you're listening to will determine your cadence to an extent. I'm not going to go out and run a four-minute mile because I'm I'm listening to, you know, really fast music. But it's the truth. Your body will sync up with with the music you're listening to. Um, and then one, one other example of just our tendency to sync up. It comes, it's a very different sort of thing, but it comes from the Millennium Bridge in London. Uh, in, in the year 2000, uh, the turn of the uh, millennium, there was this an unveiling of this footbridge, this absolute spectacle, this beautiful, beautiful piece of architecture in London. And it's a footbridge that crosses the River Thames. And... Um, the, you know, the engineers did their thing, they designed it and, and tested it, and they tested it for vertical strength, for how much force, how many thousands of people could we have on the bridge and it be fine. Well, the thing they didn't test it for was this desire to sync up as human beings. So when they open the bridge in the year 2000, they, they unveil it, and there's this mass of people that show up to cross the bridge, go to the other side of the river, The bridge, like all suspension bridges, it it has some sway to it. And so you get a couple thousand people on the bridge, and the bridge just has this tiny little bit of sway, and the people start responding to the sway of the bridge, and they start, like, trying to, like, you know, balance themselves. And so now you get a couple of thousand people who all of a sudden are sensing this together, and they start syncing up with everybody else and moving as one side to side and notice the flex of the bridge. You see the bridge swaying back? Some of you are getting seasick right now. You should have taken Dramamine. That's terrifying. All because there's this, there's this tendency that people, they, they want to sync up with the people around them. They had to close the bridge for a couple years until they fixed the problem. So all of that to say, we have this tendency, nature, but human beings especially, have this desire to sync up with what's happening around us. We will naturally do it unless, unless, We understand what's happening, and we deliberately choose to do something else. And that's a difficult choice to make. When when here's what's happening all around us, and we're going to see it to say, "Uh ah, this is what everybody else is thinking, this is what everybody else is doing, and I'm deliberately going to choose to do something different. Human beings will naturally sync up with the values of the, the prevailing values of the dominant culture unless we are intentionally committed to a different set of values and unless we have people in our life who are doing the same thing. So this is not just our physical bodies like moving when our song comes on. This is us saying, I want to be like everybody else. And, and so when, when the culture around us has a set of values that they have adopted to say this is good, this is right, this is true, it's going to be the most natural thing in the world for us to say, yeah, like this, this is good, this is right, this is true, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to follow these values. And it's going to be a really difficult decision for people to say, actually, no, there's a different set of values that I am going to choose to live by. And to choose to live by these values is going to put me out of step, out of sync with this over here. Have you felt that? Is there any way in which you choosing to follow Jesus has put you out of step in some ways with the values of the culture around you. 
And I would say that if the answer is no, that's a pretty good indication of who we are most synced up with. If, if we can't say that there are any ways that we as people of faith are choosing to make decisions about our life and about our thinking and about our actions and about all of the things that make up our life that are different, that are in some ways at odds with the prevailing values of the culture, then it's a pretty good indication that we have synced up with the culture and we're, we're, we're in lockstep with the culture and not necessarily with Jesus. Because here's the thing, the essence of, of this series and the essence of the book of 1 Corinthians is pointing people to Jesus and to say that as people of faith, we trust that Jesus actually has a better rhythm to live by than any other rhythm that the culture will give us. That this is what happened when Jesus came into the world. It was like Jesus came into this world and there were all of these sort of competing rhythms happening all around him, but Jesus comes in and he marches to the beat of a very different drum. And he actually gives the beat of a very different drum. And because of Jesus, because of his values, it put him at odds with people who were in leadership, religious and political leadership in this day. Now, the values of Jesus, he called them the kingdom of God. He, he just steps into the world and he starts living this, this new, this fresh, this absolutely beautiful kind of life. And he says, this is what the kingdom of God is like. And then he gives us this beautiful picture of what these values are. And you find them in your Bible in Matthew chapter 5, verses 3 to 10. Uh, some people call them the Beatitudes. But li- listen to this. This is, this is what Jesus embodied. He says this, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek or the gentle, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness or justice, for they will be filled. Let's just pause there for a second. Do you hear how out of step that is from the world Jesus lived in and the world we live in? Blessed are the poor in spirit? Uh, well, that's not, I mean, no. That's, everybody knows that the people who are blessed are the people who have their life together or who at least can pretend that they have their life together. And Jesus says, actually, blessed are the poor. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who know that they don't have it together because theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed are those who mourn, who, who have experienced the grief and the loss and the pain that goes with those things, and they are going to be comforted by God. Blessed are the meek. And again, that word meek, it just means gentle. And now if there's anything that's opposed to to the values of culture, it's blessed are the gentle. In a violent world, Jesus has the audacity to come in and say, it's not the violent, it's not the oppressors, it's not the dictators, not the powerful who are blessed, but it's the gentle. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness because they're the ones who are going to be filled by God. And he goes on. So blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted, who are, who are hurt because of righteousness, because theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And this is what Jesus lived. Jesus was all of these things. He embodied it. These were his values. This was the rhythm that he lived by. And certain people, religious and political leaders, they looked at Jesus and they were threatened by these values because they liked the way things were. And they they got a lot of value and a lot of money from the way things were. And so they were threatened by Jesus. But then there was this other group of people who looked at the life that Jesus was living and they were so deeply moved. They were so compelled by this this brand new way of living and it resonated with something so deep inside of them that they started to march to his drum as well. And they synced up with him and they started following him and what they found was that he was true. Was that the way he was living was actually the best possible way to live. It was actually the way people were intended to live from the very beginning. And so we can, as people of faith, and so I realize that we're, we're here this morning in a wide variety of places, coming from a wide variety of places. Like some of us, maybe we are just exploring faith in Jesus. Um, 
and we're, we're not sure about this whole Jesus thing, and that's totally cool. Like, I, I am so glad you are here to just, to just hopefully learn uh, a little bit more about who this Jesus is. But for some of us, we're here saying, like, yeah, Jesus, like, I'm following him. Our vision as a church is to be a disciple who makes disciples. Um, and, and so we're following him, and we can recognize that if we choose to sync up with Jesus— that there are going to be those same two reactions, that some people around us are going to not like it very much, and we're probably going to take heat for, uh, for the values that we have chosen to live by, but others are going to be incredibly compelled, and they're going to see Jesus in our lives, and they're going to be drawn to him, and they themselves are going to sync up with him. So this, this is what faith, this is what... Um, This letter to the Corinthian church is all about is how we keep our minds, our hearts, our eyes on Jesus and we walk in time in rhythm with him. Now, how many of you know it is tough to follow Jesus in Corinth? I mean, it it is hard to follow Jesus in Corinth. So here's what I want to do. I think there are some incredible parallels between the world that Paul was writing into, the world that these first Christians were trying to carve their way in and our world today. So I want to just unpack a couple of examples of what these first Christians were going through, what their context was, that will set the stage for the next couple of weeks of teachings. And so here's just a snapshot of the church in Corinth. Uh, The church was about six years old. Paul planted this church uh, six years earlier, and you can read that whole story in, in the book of Acts, in your Bible, in Acts chapter 18. You hear all about how the, origin, uh, the origins of the church in Corinth is about 60 people. So I don't know how many people we have in this room right now, maybe 120, something like that. So about half this size, that's the whole church. And they're, they're trying to figure out this whole Jesus thing. Um, and now Corinth was this crazy metropolitan city. It was a port city, so it's right on the, the border of the, uh, around the coast of the Mediterranean Sea. And just like most port cities, even in our day, it's, it was sort of very progressive. Like lots of ideas flowing in and out of the city, had access to lots of goods and ideas from all over the world. And so it created this kind of this vibe of, of, of change that was happening all the time. Religion in Corinth, uh, you have these people, the, of these 60 people who have chosen to follow Jesus, to sync up with him, you have this wide variety of religious backgrounds. Like you have some, you imagine a church gathering like this where the church comes together and, and there's, a, there's a young girl who is a, a good Jewish girl. She grew up in a Jewish family. She read Torah. She went to synagogue. She observed Sabbath <clears throat> and, and was just surrounded in a Jewish world. But her family has put their trust in Jesus, and so now they're following him. And sitting right beside her, right in the room, is this other young girl who grew up in a pagan Roman family, and she grew up going to the temple of Dionysus and making sacrifices to this this goddess, this mystery cult. And both of these young women find themselves in church together trying to figure out how to be together, how to follow Jesus together. But can you imagine some of the tensions that would be created that, that, that this is the norm in this group of 60 people. Um, and we start to feel some of these, these differences even in our own setting. Like, in this room, like, we have drastic cultural differences. Uh, we, have, we have families, you know, who, who grew up farming and who grew up, like, with the, just the rhythms of agriculture. And, and we have those who grew up in urban settings. We have families uh, that grew up following Jesus, and we, we went to church, and we go to church every weekend, and that's a part of our rhythm, and some of us are just finding out what it means to follow Jesus, um, and, and we're just exploring it, and we're all here together just trying, trying to figure this out together, and sometimes it creates issues. It creates struggles of how do you create community with a diverse group of people. One of the other issues in Corinth was uh, ethics. Um, so the culture around them at the time was a culture of incredible sexual freedom. Um, there was actually this verb that was coined called to Corinthianize a person. And, and what that meant was like you introduce people to all sorts of devious sex, sexual behaviors. And so um, there, is, there is this 
this piece of what Paul is trying to write into to say, how, what does Jesus have to say to a world that is just sort of moving down the path of sexual freedom? I think there are correlations to our culture today. Uh, and then the last big difference was economic, that you had very wealthy and very poor sitting in the same room in the same church trying to figure life out. So the big problem in Corinth is this. Um, there are divisions. There are, there are people who are yeah, you can read that on your own. Um, there are people, you know, who are divided over personalities. Who's the leader? Who, who are we following? There are people who are divided over uh, who's the smartest, over social standing, over the use of spiritual gifts. So here you have this small minority, these 60 people, trying to follow Jesus in this culture that is pulling them aside, this loud rhythm that is coming at them from every place, and they are constantly being pulled off. The, 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 the sense of following Jesus, and they're losing the rhythm of Jesus. And so it is tough to follow Jesus in Corinth. So I want to illustrate this by uh, having Jarvis and Mark come up front. Jarvis and Mark, um, come on up. And so what we're going to do, you get to participate in this, and so what we're going to do, we're going to have Mark stand over here, and Mark is going to clap in a rhythm, and your job is just to clap in time with him. So Mark is, is going to lay down the funky beat, and you just get to, to do what he does, okay? Follow his rhythm. Is that, is that clear? And we're going we're gonna to see how well you can do this. Okay, here we go, Mark. Come on, people, you got this. Piece of cake. Yeah. How's it going? Cool. Thank you, guys. They are, they're pretty good. Yeah, he said they're pretty good for Mennonites, so that's nice. <laughs> nice. So was that hard? Was that tough to find the rhythm? I, I noticed some of you who were, like, who were really good, some of you, you have about as much rhythm as I do, um, but the ones of you who, who really stayed in time with him in the middle of all the other noise were like, you were fixed on him, right? And did it make it more difficult when I stood in the way and kind of blocked, blocked the view? I think this is, like, this is a picture of, of, of what the church is called to do. And it's a picture of what, G, what Paul is encouraging the Corinthian Christians to do is to keep their eyes fixed on Jesus, and this is why he says this, going back to verse 10, he says, I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree that you be synced up with one another in what you say, so that there are no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly united, synced up in mind and thought. And the only way that's going to happen is if we can agree on who's setting the rhythm for our lives. If we can agree on who the drum major is that we're following. I mean, if you're a marching band, I know nothing. Any drum majors in the room? Are you, Natalie, are you the drum major? That is awesome. That's two times Natalie could have been up on stage this morning. I don't know what I have you do, but <laughs> give us some. Um, so a couple of months ago, I got pulled into the vortex of YouTube. You ever, you ever do that? Like you just start watching a video and then it's just like, it's like two days later and you know, haven't eaten. Um, not quite that bad, but I, I got pulled in because, and I started watching the drum major auditions for the Ohio State University. Um, best marching band in the world. And so I, I, I just, I'm like, I'm watching auditions, like a couple of hours of auditions just because I can't get enough of this. And, um, and I think that there's this, there's this correlation to say, like the drum major is the one who sets the rhythm for the whole band. They're the one that everybody else takes their cues from. And in the church, we say emphatically and unapologetically that Jesus is our drum major. He is the one who's at the center. He's the one who we keep time with. And only will we be able to be together, to be unified, to be synced up as a church to the extent that Jesus is at the center. And so Paul, again and again throughout this letter, everything he says, every challenge to the church, every ethical teaching, it all comes from this place of saying, but remember who's at the center of it all. Remember Jesus and remember the one that you're following. Um, so I want to talk real quickly about a couple of different ways that churches can be synced up. 
Um, and and want to talk about what it means to be a Jesus-centered church. And you might, if you've been around Journey, you're probably familiar with that language. We talk about it some. But I think that is what Paul is doing in this verse and throughout this letter, is he's calling people, be a Jesus-centered church. But there are other options. And some of us have experienced other options of not being Jesus-centered. And the first option to be synced up is to be in a bounded church. And I would, I would suggest that many of us grew up or have experienced church as a bounded group. And maybe some of us still do. And, and here's what a bounded group is. You have, this, you have this boundary, and it's very clear who's in and who is out. Um, bounded groups, they happen all over the place. I'm a member of REI, um, Recreational Equipment Incorporated, and it is a fantastic group to belong to. It is good to belong. I get perks because I'm a member. I'm a card-carrying member of REI. I get, you know, discounts and the opportunity to buy things at uh, garage sales and, and things like that, like cool garage sales, not like neighborhood garage sales. All this stuff because I belong. It is a bounded group, and you belong to bounded groups, and there, there's some benefit to them, but there are also some problems when the church does this. Uh, bounded groups, they, they always have a gate, and that, there's my gate, I know, you, I know that's what you, you knew that's what that was. There's a way to get in, but you have to conform in order to get in through the gate. Um, and Jesus, like he, he interacted with Judaism in the first century, which was a bounded group. There were insiders who were the Jews and outsiders who were everybody else. Gentiles, Samaritans, tax collectors, they were excluded. And so if you wanted to convert to Judaism, you could. There was a way to do that. You had, to, uh, you had to, to go through some rituals and you had to convert to become a Jew, which if you were a dude required a minor surgery, um, which was kind of a bummer. Um, I have a little bit of a problem. Circumcision jokes never get old. That's just... Uh, so so you, had to like, you had to get inside somehow. But the problem, there are some problems with bounded groups. One is there's no movement. Once you're in, you're just in. You're not headed anywhere. You just exist. So there's no real, it's not dynamic. It's static. Um, it, they can sometimes be really legalistic. But what happens when you move too close to the boundary? Well, you can get kicked out. Right? If, you, if you end up moving too close, too close to the line, you end up pushing the limits, well, now you're no longer part of us. You're out. You are an outsider. And there's lots of pain that has been caused in churches, right? Because, because churches spend a lot of time focusing on the boundaries, who's in and who's out, and maintaining these boundaries. And people get kicked out. Uh, and bounded groups create an us and them dynamic. Like, you know what's wrong with the world? It's those people. Those people who look like that and act like that and talk like that and vote like that and all of that, and it's insider-outsider language, and this is a problem. And so this is not the kind of church we want to be. So Jesus, he, he does something about these bounded groups, and what he starts to do is he races the line. Um, and so you notice on this next one, there's, there's no line. And this is what Jesus does. Like when he, when he heals a Roman centurion's son, and he says these words, I have found... No one in Israel with that kind of faith. Do you know what Jesus is doing? He's erasing the line. You don't know who's in and who's out. Uh, When he tells a story where a Samaritan man is a hero of compassion, he's erasing the line. When he ministers to a Samaritan woman, he's erasing the line. And so one of the, the next options for us is just to erase all the lines. And it creates a fuzzy group. Right? It creates this, this idea of like, well, I don't really know who's in and who's out, and maybe it doesn't matter. Maybe the best thing for us is to just all get along. Let's just coexist. Let's just be together. No insiders, outsiders. Let's just uh, find our common unity in just wanting to be together. And, and churches do this a lot. This is a very popular way to go in our current cultural moment. Many of you who are over 50 grew up in churches like this. And most of you who are under 50 have friends and live in a world that looks a lot like this. You do what's right for you, I'll do what's right for me. Um, Henry David Thoreau, he's the one who kind of coined this phrase, marching to the beat of a different drum. He said it this way. He said, if any man does not keep pace with his companions, perhaps it is because he hears a different drummer. Let him keep in step to the music which he hears, however measured and far away. 
And there's something kind of cool about that, isn't it? You get to march to the beat of your own drum. Don't let anybody tell you what to do or what to believe or, or what, you, yeah, what your ac- actions need to be. Everybody, it's just free range. Uh, my first album from Garth Brooks, I used to listen to country music, was No Fences. Right? It's just like, ah, it's freedom. But here's the problem when churches do this. Um, we talk a lot about acceptance. You're accepted. But we lose words like accountability. We lose words like um, self-denial, um, conversion. And, and we just, we talk about how much we, we want to belong, but we lose that sense of yes, but there is a transformation that's going to happen because we're part of the church. And, and so I, I think this is something we have, to be, we have to be aware of. Jesus erases the boundary, yes, but he also does something else something incredibly important, is he places his life at the center of it all. And he says that when I am lifted up, this is what Jesus says, when I am lifted up, I will draw people, all people, all kinds of people to myself. And so Jesus places himself at the center and he invites people to follow him, to sync up with him. And so as a Jesus-centered church, is what Paul is trying to do to the church in Corinth is to say, you are being pulled in a thousand other directions. There is a rhythm that is intense and is going to try to pull you off. But you need together to stay focused on Jesus, on who he is, on his life, on his teachings, on his death, on his resurrection. And, and when you do, the question isn't who's in or who's out. The question is which way are you pointed? Which, what's the orientation of your life? Are you pursuing Jesus? Are you becoming a disciple of Jesus? Is Jesus Lord of your life? And this is the question that Jesus-centered churches ask. They don't say who's in and who's out. Because, I mean, they're obviously there are going to be people who, who walk away from Jesus. And we don't reject them and we don't Um, you know, we don't just sort of like, um, you know, sort of curse them as they walk away. We love them, and and we pray for them, and we walk with them, hoping that they will turn and come back to Jesus, and we invite them to come back. But there's no question that we are pursuing Jesus, and he sets the values for our life. And the closer, this is a cool thing about a Jesus-centered church, is the closer we get to Jesus, you know what happens to our own relationships? The closer we get to each other. The more synced up we are with Jesus, the more synced up we will be with each other. And this is Paul's whole approach in this whole letter of 1 Corinthians is to say, just like remember Jesus at the center. Jesus is the one who is in charge. He is Lord. And if he is, then nothing else will be. Your social status, the amount of money you have or don't have, it will not be Lord. Your background, your religious background, it will not be Lord. Your political affiliation, it will not be Lord. The neighborhood you live in, it will not be Lord. The kind of cars you drive, it will not be Lord. Because if Jesus is, all of those other things fade into the distance. This is the most important task of the church. I'm convinced of it, is to keep Jesus at the center. It is the most important task of a disciple's life and of a a group of disciples because we need to intentionally make this decision personally, but we have to have people around us who are helping us keep in time with him. So, some questions. Some questions about this. Um... What is the rhythm that you are keeping in step with? Uh, Are you you pressing into Jesus? Is Jesus Lord of your life? Are you following him? Does Jesus have your highest allegiance? That there is nothing more important to you than, than following him and being his disciple? Do you have other people around you who are helping you stay in step with him? Or would you say, is there any way in your life where you are getting pulled off rhythm? Where, where you have, you know what, like just because of the noise around you, you have gotten pulled off and you have adopted other values that don't look like Jesus and you've put them, um, you've synced up with them. Do you have people around you? The best indicator of who you will be, and this is true for any of us, the best indication of who we will be in five years is who we're spending time with. Did you realize that? 
If you want to know what you will be like, the values that you will live out in five years, look at the people who you are syncing up with in your life. This is a, this is a big, big deal. And so uh, as a church, the, the phrase, the confession, the powerful confession, Jesus is Lord. Is, is, this, is this unbelievable statement that says nothing else is going to lead my life except Jesus. And if you're at a place this morning as we end the teaching, um, I would invite you just in your own way, in your own voice, in your own time, as we just stop here for a moment of silence to say the words, Jesus is Lord. And you can do it not as a sense of, I I think it's true, but of you saying, it's true for me. And I am choosing to make him Lord. And if you can't say that, that is okay. It's okay if you're at a place where you're not able to make that confession because it it is incredibly powerful to proclaim this. And so I, I want to just give us some space and, and to, if you, uh, if you would like to, if you'd like to make this confession to God saying Jesus is Lord, I invite you to give, to have that space to do that. Amen.